Tidal, CoBuzz, Amazon HD, and now Apple Music Lossless. Yup, streaming lossless audio is now flavor of the month. But should you bother with it? Let's take a look. Welcome back to Channel Audio Nerds. It's great to see you all again, and this is episode two of the series I've decided to call Audio Explained, where we take a more in-depth look at various aspects of audio tech. And today we're going to have a look at another hot topic, lossy versus lossless digital audio. Now this issue has had a lot of airtime recently as Apple is just about to launch its brand new Apple Music lossless streaming tier. And the big deal about this is that it's at no extra cost. Now services such as Tidal or CoBuzz typically charge a hefty premium for their lossless streaming tiers. But what is lossless audio? Is it really that much an improvement over lossy audio? And more to the point, should you care about it? Let's start by reminding ourselves what lossless audio files are. In essence, they are the original CD quality digital audio files produced by the mixing engineer, i.e. 16-bit 44.1 kHz audio. And this is true for the vast majority of recorded music, although newer recordings are mastered digitally in higher resolution and sample rate files. But let's keep it simple. The standard lossless file is a 16-bit 44.1 kHz PCM bitstream, which, when you take into consideration the stereo channels, gives a bitrate of 1,411 kilobits per second. When you transfer the files from a CD onto a computer, they are called WAV, WAV files, and although they sound fabulous, they are big files. So, for example, a typical four and a half minute pop song may be around 50 to 60 megabytes in size. Bear in mind that the first digital audio players such as this, the Rio 500 from 2000, which was my first MP3 player, had only 64 megabytes of storage. So clearly it was not very practical to use WAV files for portable audio back in the day. You'd only fit one song onto this Rio. Also, with dial-up internet connections being the norm at the turn of the century, it would take literally hours to transfer a 60 megabyte song, mainly via illegal file sharing sites such as Napster, which were highly prevalent at the time. So to address these problems, there were some very clever audio and computer nerds who came up with clever ways of compressing the audio data into smaller files. And to this day, there are two ways of doing it. The first involves squashing the file into a smaller container without losing any of the original data. This is basically how zip files work, and this is called lossless compression. Essentially, when the file is being played, special software or hardware decompresses a file, so you are playing exactly the same data as from the original WAV file. This is essentially a bit-perfect copy of the original file. The most popular lossless compression formats are FLAC and ALAC, which is Apple's take on it. Although the files are smaller than WAV files, they're still quite beefy, as there is a limit to how much you can compress a file without actually losing data. So the other approach is to compress the original file, not only by squashing it, but also by removing some of the original data from the music file, which obviously allows much more compression. But how is this achieved? Well, it relies on some complex mathematical transformations and algorithms, along with a branch of science called psychoacoustics, which, despite the slightly sinister title, is basically all about how our brains perceive sound. So for a start, you might recall that the upper frequency limit of human hearing is around 20 kHz, with most adults, particularly when you get to my age in your 40s, struggling to hear anything above 15 kHz. So, for a start, common compression algorithms will get rid of all the data relating to these higher frequency sounds without there being any audible difference to most listeners. Then we get into psychoacoustic tricks like simultaneous masking, which means that if a soft sound is playing at exactly the same time as a louder sound, you're unlikely to hear the soft sound, so it might as well be binned. You also get temporal masking, which relies on the fact that if a quiet sound follows a loud sound, you are unlikely to hear that either, so it can be removed without detriment. Minimal audition threshold means that if a sound is below a certain decibel level in a mix, you won't hear it regardless of what else is playing, so it too can be removed. So by doing all this, lossy audio formats can reduce the bitrate 
to 320 kilobits per second or less, which is obviously a fraction of the CD quality audio bitrate. So for example, the most popular early lossy music format, MP3, which became synonymous with pirated music online, was often set to encode at a bitrate of 128 kilobits per second, and the original iTunes music store files were encoded at 128 kilobits per second using a more sophisticated algorithm known as AAC. At this bitrate, our 60 megabyte WAV file could be shrunk down to something like 4 megabytes, much better for storing on our tiny portable players or pinging over dial-up connections. Compression technology has developed a lot over the years and now includes features such as variable bit rates, which allow more intensive, complicated bits of music to have a higher bit rate than the simpler passages. Overall, lossy audio revolutionized digital audio consumption both for internet sharing of music files, whether that was legal or illegal, as well as portable audio with the rise of the iPod. In fact, the original iPod only had 5 gigs of storage, but thanks to the marvel of lossy compression, Steve Jobs was able to get up there on stage and boast that you could store a thousand songs in your pocket, which to my generation who'd grown up lugging around cassette tapes seemed a bit like genuine magic. So, Fast forward to 2008 when Spotify first launched. Most people were still on limited data home broadband connections and 4G wasn't a thing for mobile data yet. Thus, it was no surprise that Spotify elected to use lossy compressed audio files for streaming music. In Spotify's case, it was Og Vorbis, which is an open source compressed lossy format. But nowadays, fast fiber home broadband is pretty common, and even mobile data connections either over 4 or 5G are faster and cheaper with more generous data allowances, and this means that streaming lossless files is now a viable proposition. Predictably, audio files have leapt onto the lossless streaming and even high-res streaming bandwagon, with services such as Tidal and Cobuzz offering expensive, premium lossless streaming plans to willing audio geeks. Both these services are also integrated into many different pieces of high-end audio equipment. With its recent announcement of lossless music for the same price as lossy streaming, Apple are undoubtedly looking to shake up this market. So, lossless music is clearly the way forward. It's a no-brainer, right? Well, as in all things audio related, not quite. The first thing to remember is that most people who listen to their music on their phones now do so using Bluetooth headsets or earbuds, such as the incredibly popular AirPod series. And the sad fact is that there is no Bluetooth codec which can reproduce a lossless bitstream. So even if you're listening to a lossless file on your phone, it's being compressed in a lossy way in order for it to be sent over Bluetooth to your earphones. So that's right, even Apple's new £550 AirPod Max headphones will not be able to play Apple Music lossless in full quality. However, rather ridiculously, the £9 Lightning to 3.5mm adapter will be able to pass up to 48kHz 24-bit audio to any pair of wired headphones you connect to it. The second and most important thing to remember though is that the science behind lossy audio is just so good that most people cannot tell the difference between a lossless and a good quality lossy music file but I can hear you scoffing already. I'm an audiophile, of course I can tell the difference between a crappy 160 kilobits per second mp3 file and a CD WAV file. Well, I'm willing to bet a fair amount of money that you actually can't, and I'd urge you to go and visit this website, abx.digitalfeed.net, which allows you to put this to a test. It essentially presents you with a series of blind ABX tests between lossless and various types of lossy file. The best one to get started with is the lossless versus mp3 test, where you can change the bitrate of the mp3 file. I did this test using my Hi-Fi Man Sundaras and the iFi Zendac version 2. And also I used my home Hi-Fi setup, which is a Mac Mini connected to a Cyrus DAC-X feeding a Cyrus 8 amp going into 1500 pound PMC speakers. Now I know that's not the most high end by some people's standards, but it's what I use daily and I think sounds pretty great. Using both of these systems, I could not reliably differentiate between anything above 192 kilobits per second MP3 and the original lossless file. 
even after repeated testing, and I certainly couldn't tell the difference between AAC at 256 kilobits per second, which is what Apple Music currently uses for streaming and lossless. This particular test on this website is limited by the five songs that are chosen for the comparison, and there is not, for example, any classical music or jazz. However, you can run similar tests using software like FUBAR 2K with an ABX plugin and use your own music files. And I've done this and having used lots of different files from various genre, I got exactly the same result. So for me, lossy audio above 192 kilobits per second seems to be indistinguishable from lossless regardless of the equipment I use. I'd urge you to do these tests yourselves and see where your limit is. Suffice to say, the vast majority of humanity, even those with super acute hearing, can't distinguish a 320 kilobits per second MP3 file from the original CD audio file. So where does that leave us? Well, for a start, I think we can honestly agree that unless you are listening to your streaming music through high quality wired headphones using a good amp and DAC, you are unlikely to hear any difference. So, for example, if you're on a limited mobile data phone plan, lossy streaming from the likes of Spotify or Apple Music is absolutely fine. You'll get much more music for the same amount of data. It also casts doubt on whether it's worth paying extra for a subscription service offering a lossless streaming tier. Now, with the forthcoming Apple Music lossless, along with Amazon Prime HD, you are getting lossless for no extra cost. So as long as you have the data, you might as well stream in lossless. Even the placebo effect of listening to the original quality file will probably make you happy. And I still archive all the CDs that I buy in FLAC for home use, as I don't like the idea of losing data I've paid for, even though I probably can't hear the difference. But I do use lossy files out and about on my FIO M3K as I can pretty much fit my entire music library encoded into 256 kilobits per second AAC on a 256 gigabyte micro SD card, which is really handy. So there you have it guys, don't hate on lossy audio, it's still pretty decent. But those are just my thoughts, let me hear yours, I'd be particularly interested if any of you have done ABX testing. Thanks for watching, as always, look out for the next video coming up very soon, and until then, stay safe.